Hi, my name is Jonas and I'm a doctoral student in the Seismology and Wave Physics group at ETH Zurich. This presentation is about near real-time ambient seismic noise source inversion. After showing you the methodology and the equations that we need to invert for the noise source distribution, I'll share some synthetic and real data results with you. Natural ambient seismic noise is also known as microseisms. Depending on which frequency range you look at, these have different names, namely the primary and the secondary microseisms. The primary microseisms are at lower frequencies, roughly between 0.05 to 0.1 Hz, whereas the secondary microseisms are usually between 0.1 and 0.2 Hz. One big difference between the two is the source mechanism, as in how are these sources generated. The primary microseisms are caused by the coupling of ocean wave energy into the seafloor as the wave approaches shallower water. That means the sources of this are usually along the coastlines. Secondary microseisms, on the other hand, occur when ocean waves of the same frequency traveling in opposite directions meet. These then overlap and create a pressure wave that goes down to the ocean floor, creating a seismic wave. In our research, we focus on secondary microseisms. These heavily depend on the wave height, which means the distribution is very heterogeneous and changes constantly. The source mechanism is quite well understood, and the main seismic waves generated are surface waves. The goal of our research is to perform daily inversions of the noise distribution of the secondary microseisms. Now, why do we want to do this? We hope that this will help with full waveform ambient noise tomography methods, as knowledge of the source distribution is necessary to do this. Secondly, we hope that near real-time monitoring methods can be improved since changes in the source distribution might be interpreted as velocity changes. But if we know the source distribution, we can reduce this effect. Finally, since the source mechanism is quite well understood, we can use the distribution of the secondary microseism to infer information about the past and the current ocean state. Let's continue with the numerical methods. Which equations do we need to perform these inversions? To forward model cross-correlations, we can use this equation here where C is the cross-correlation wave field, G are the Green's functions for two different stations, and S is the power spectral density of the source distribution. This equation allows us to take any source distribution as input to forward model cross-correlations. For example, here we have a significant wave height map from the WaveWatch 3 model, and a few station locations noted by the black triangles, and we use this to then forward model all the cross-correlations for the different station pairs, as we can see here in the section plot. One thing that we can nicely see in the section plot is the surface wave move out. Let's have a closer look at a single station pair. As we can see, the cross-correlation for this station pair has a very strong asymmetry. In particular, if we look at the surface wave arrival window, we see that the causal part has much higher amplitudes than the acausal part. This is due to the noise source distribution being very heterogeneous, and this asymmetry tells us where the dominant noise sources are. So how can we use this to then infer information about the noise source distribution? What we do is we take a measurement in this cross-correlation, namely the logarithmic energy ratio. To calculate the logarithmic energy ratio, we compute the energy in the expected surface wave arrival time windows in the causal and acausal part of the cross-correlation. We then take the ratio and the natural log. One advantage of this measurement is that it is largely insensitive to unknown 3D Earth structure. This enables us to use a very basic velocity model for the forward modeling of the cross correlations. To be able to perform an inversion, we need to define a misfit. The misfit is simply the difference between the observed and synthetic measurement. That means the smaller the misfit, the closer our model is to the data. This misfit allows us to compute sensitivity kernels, which we then use for the inversion. Noise source sensitivity kernels can be computed with this equation. To calculate the sensitivity kernel, we again need the Green's functions g for two stations and the measurement dependent joint source. The measurement here is the logarithmic energy ratio that I described before. These sensitivity kernels tell us where an increase or decrease in source strength will decrease the misfit. Here's an example of such a source sensitivity kernel for the same station pair that we used earlier. As we can see, the sensitivity kernel has a strong blue and therefore negative area just off the coast of Europe. This is where the dominant noise source is in the forward modeling. So we have a blue area that means an increase in noise source strength will decrease the misfit. And if we have a red area, a decrease in noise source strength will decrease the misfit. To summarize, we use a cross-correlation equation here to forward model cross-correlations for any noise source distribution in any station location, and we then use the sensitivity kernel equation to obtain information about where we should increase or decrease the source strength. The main computational cost in these equations comes from computing the Green's functions g and modeling the power spectral density of the noise source distribution s. 
So how can we optimize this? To optimize the computation of the Green's functions, we use pre-computed wave fields, in our case from Axisem. These are computed using the principle of reciprocity, where the receiver acts as a point source and we record the seismograms at all grid points. This then gives us a Green's function database that we can reuse in every iteration. Secondly, to optimize the parameterization of the power spectral density of the noise source distribution, we use spatially variable grids. That means we create a grid that has a higher spatial resolution in our area of interest and a lower spatial resolution everywhere else. One example of that can be seen here. Now let's say we want to forward model cross correlations, and we have a model that has strong sources in certain areas. These spatially variable grids allow us to increase the spatial resolution in areas of strong noise sources and decrease it everywhere else, as we can see here. Now how do we use all of this to perform an inversion for the source distribution? An inversion scheme is a gradient-based iterative method, namely steepest descent. The gradient is simply the sum of all sensitivity kernels. That means the gradient tells us when increase or decrease in source strength will decrease the misfit for all station pairs. The inversion starts with an initial distribution. We usually use a homogeneous distribution in the ocean as we know that the secondary microcytosms are created there. We then use this initial distribution to forward model cross correlations. We then take the measurement on these and the observed cross correlations and compute the adjoined sources. From this, we get the sensitivity kernels that allows us to compile the gradient. We perform some smoothing and a step length test to then update the source distribution. Then finally, this updated source distribution is used to forward model the next set of cross correlations. We usually perform about 10 iterations, as synthetic tests have shown that the misfit converges rather nicely after the first few iterations. So let's have a look at some synthetic results. For this synthetic test, we again used a significant wavefront map from the WaveWatch 3 model to forward model cross correlations for 186 stations surrounding the Northern Atlantic. We then perform 10 iterations of our inversion scheme to invert for these synthetically created observed cross correlations. As we can see, the main dominant noise sources in the target model, shown by the yellow circles here, are also present in the inversion model after 10 iterations, albeit with considerable smearing. In this synthetic test, we are able to reduce the misfit by more than 90%. We also performed synthetic tests on a global scale, using the same model, but 173 stations distributed all over the globe. Similarly to the synthetic tests in the Novel Atlantic, most of the dominant noise sources are present in the inversion model after 10 iterations. Finally, we applied our inversion scheme to real data. We downloaded and processed the data for each individual day using OpsPy. Looking at the individual days, we see that there are pretty strong sources in marginal seas, for example, Hudson Bay and the Caspian Sea, which we do not expect. This is mainly due to the lack of signal that we have in one day of data. To conclude, we have shown that the inversion scheme works quite well and synthetic tests show promising results. However, data inversions show strong sources in marginal seas due to the lack of signal in one day of data. That means we probably have to use longer time frames to increase the signal to noise ratio. After converting the wave field, we are able to perform an inversion, for example, 10 iterations of 3,100 cross collations on 600 cores within one hour. That means this inversion scheme is definitely suitable for daily inversions. The main takeaway of this presentation is that we are able to invert for the noise source distribution of the secondary microcytosms on a daily basis. We are looking to collaborate with noise tomographers to figure out how this information can help improve methods in ambient noise tomography. If you want to collaborate or have any other questions or comments, feel free to send me an email. Thanks for watching.